Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media production, and our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today, Alex Goldner will be back. We'll actually talk about lower thirds in motion. We said we were going to talk about lower thirds in motion last week, but we got just so many questions about motion that we just answered those, which was fine. <laughs> so but we're going we're gonna to now talk about lower thirds in motion and how you get them into Final Cut. So Alex will be joining us for the second hour. It should be a lot of fun. Um, you know, and for those of you who don't aren't don't use Motion that much, it's a fifty dollar application that does an incredible amount of graphics, and so it's really worth uh, knowing about it. Um, so, so definitely check it out. If you have questions for the first hour or the second hour, uh, you can use askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. Uh, you can ask the question twenty four seven, so it doesn't even have to be during the show, and we'll pull it in later and uh, and throw it into the queue. Uh, so go ahead and use that. Of course, you can also use Makana. You can vote on questions, chat with each other. Um, so you can do all that. If you're trying to figure out how to get into Makana. It's in the mail that goes out every day. If you don't know how to do that, then you can go to officehours.global and sign up for join us and then you'll be there. <laughs> so anyway, that's how that works. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? Thank you, Alex. First up is Tony Mobley, Newton, Georgia. Is it safe to update to Mac OS 14.2 on my Mimo Live Mac MIDI machine? Uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, Tony, in the spirit of not knowing the answer, but still wanting to hear myself talk, I'm going to say, um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, here's what I know. Um, one of the things that happened at 14.1, I don't know about, four, uh, but, but it was not a problem at 14, is that Apple changed the way it um, changed the requirements for something to be called a virtual camera. Now, interestingly enough, it didn't happen at 14.0, and everybody always says, oh, be careful when you go to a, a .0 release. I always like to wait to the .1 release, Alex is going to say. I like to wait till the .5. But um, at 14.1, they changed the requirements of what a virtual camera was. Now, if you use virtual cameras in Mimo Live and you're currently on 14.0, or prior, you will you will potentially run into a problem where um, virtual cameras are acting differently. There's a hack for it. Um, you could I found it in five minutes. Basically, you have to go into a command line and type a bunch of stuff, and at the end of it, it says equals zero, and it'll start working again. But just be careful. Make sure your uh, virtual camera, if your virtual camera stops working, it is fixable. Go ahead, guy. Uh, let's see if you can see my screen, but it still says 14.1. So here's Mimo Live. I use it every day. That's how I bring stuff over. So I'm using it with NDI to do screen shares into vMix. So uh, it depends on what you're using it for. So if, you're, if you've got a stable show and it's working right now, I wouldn't be cutting edge. I would just go ahead and run. So I haven't upgraded to 14.2 because what I'm using it for, it's working. And I'll let others... Uh, you know, take the hit. Uh, if I had a second system to go ahead and run it on and and put it through its paces, then I would put it on that one. But I would, if you're using it for a production machine, I would hold off, just not be so cutting edge. And that's generally the rule on a lot of things is not to go right away headstrong in unless you have a second backup machine. And and you're using virtual camera on that machine with Bimo? Uh On this one, I am not. No, I'm using okay. Media. You're using it. You're using Mimo to capture the screen and deliver it to vmix via ndi so that you have Correct. you can capture a mac screen that's because the, the ndi because vmix can't see the mac right Is yeah that... use it for other things too for grabbing records grabbing other ndi feeds and pushing them in but for what it's doing right now this this workflow works works fine with it in fact uh oliver's going to be doing a um a session this week and after hours where he's putting together an NDI Mimo Live kit uh, that we've we've got a Google Doc with all the components and he's going to be building it in after hours. So I'm excited to see what he would always come up with because it's a it's a portable kit so that you can switch uh, using his uh, software on uh, a Mac Mini or a laptop and then bring in NDI uh, sources. So there's converters for HDMI and SDI in there, but the idea is to have uh, a Netgear M4250 switch in there, and that way you can bring in all your sources. So I'm excited to see how that all comes together and how big it is, you know, because to me, size starts to matter when I'm going up and down elevators and don't have a cart and, you know, luggage with wheels. So I'm, I'm excited to see how his cart comes out because I, I, I brought out my Gator kit because we were in another after hours breakout session where everybody just dived in and said, here's what I would use, here's what I would use. So I helped a little bit, but 
I'm wondering what he finally decided on. So he bought a bunch of stuff and the list, I'll put it, I'll put it in uh, Mukana, but there's a pretty extravagant list. It, it winds up being about seven grand for everything. So it's, it's not cheap because the Mac itself is like three, four grand. So it's a, right. it's a big one. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm interested to start using Memo for as a Zoom ISO instead of possibly instead of Zoom ISO, um, but but as a for the you know so with Michael Krasny what I do is I use Zoom ISO right now and I deliver uh, ISO the ISO audio from the from Zoom to uh, Audio Hijack actually we also deliver it back to a Mix Pre and um, record it on Zoom and there's a bunch of different copies there, but I started playing with um, Memo so on my Mac Studio. Well, and, and and the stream is done by Memo. So I do the stream. The Memo Live is what streams the streams to YouTube for the people watching the show. And so, um, but one of the things I've set up now is is all of the records inside of that. So I have the ISO records of the of Michael, the ISO records of the guests, the individual ISO audio records are all set up in in there as well as the stream. And all I got to do is hit start show, and it just starts. You know, everything just lights up all the way down. Um, to to do all those recordings, um, the interesting thing is, I was, and I was worried that I was going to start pushing the studio too hard, but we're about a forty seven percent. The the my Mac studio is at a forty forty seven percent recording all of those things um, as needed uh, to and streaming, so it's um it's pretty pretty efficient. Um, the I know that for me, I'm still using thirteen. Uh, point something or other, whatever the newest 13 is, uh, but I but I have not moved to 14 yet. Uh, usually my upgrade path is that I will go to the newest operating system from Apple at the end of February. Uh, I've broken that rule a couple times and usually paid the price. Uh, and the reason is, is I have a strong opinion looking at the release schedules um, that Apple pays a lot of attention to fixing as many things as they possibly can by the uh, February. And then after that, they are doing security fixes. I mean, obviously, if there's something, a major bug, they'll do it. But there's not, we don't see anything new after that. And so then that that, that means it kind of settles. Um, my my opinion is by February, it's it's largely settled. Most of the teams are paying attention to what's going to happen at WWDC. And you're not really, you know, adding things. Like the new, I think the new 17.2 in iOS, for instance, added journaling like a whole new a whole new app <laughs> got, got added into something that, that that is there and so they're still adding things and when anytime you add something you break things and so i just want them to stop adding things before i start at before i start putting it in it also it doesn't have to do as much with apple it's this is a good example of what tony's asking for is that is that it gives all the other by me waiting it gives all the manu all the people who develop software and hardware time to get caught up, you know, time to get everything working. And so I have um, the minimum number of things that are, you know, not uh, compatible, you know, so so those things all kind of get updated as, as I go through. And so so I tend to move very slowly, but it, it's a, um, uh, yeah, anyway, it, 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 I, I have found that every time I picked before February, there was some point where I was like, man, I wish I hadn't done that. And so I've stopped doing it. <laughs> go ahead, guy. Yeah, I found that uh, list real quick just to kind of run through it. Uh, he's got the the Mac uh, up top, and then the case that he chose was this SKB. Uh, it looks like a 13-inch fly rack. So, does this have wheels? No wheels. So you're gonna you're gonna need a cart or something, or just some beefy biceps. But here's the rest of the uh, pieces of the puzzle. So I put a link to that in Mukana, but it. It's uh, this Wednesday, I believe, that you'll be able to jump in there and walk through him building that thing. So it should be fun to dive in and take a look. And and I we were able to do a a, uh, a reach out to Oliver to ask specifically to make sure that we can answer this question as accurate as possible. From Oliver, it says, uh, yes, on silicon. So yes, you can do it on silicon, not on, not on Intel. And I know that Tony has uh, silicon, um, uh, so I think he should be okay. Uh, virtual camera on Memo Live 6.5 or earlier requires changing a security setting in Mac OS to work with Mac OS 14.1 uh, or newer. So that's what Chris was talking about. 6.6 um, .6 Beta 1 has a new camera extension, virtual camera, that works on 14.2 and virtual audio devices that allow routing of audio in and out of Memo Live um, uh, and between documents. Uh, Mac OS 14 breaks Memo Live on Intel Macs. Only option is to downgrade Mac OS right now. So if you're on a silicon, which I think is what Tony's on, it shouldn't be a problem. If you're on Intel, you may have some other, other issues. Yeah, go ahead, um, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, my first question is how easy is it to slush back 
And then the second one is, don't they get uh, pre-release uh, versions of the software in beta or alpha? They do. It it just takes time. I mean, you know, like it, it is a you know, oftentimes these are library, very complex libraries, and um, you and it's also a matter of getting into what we would call gamma testing, which is when you know beta, alpha testing, which is something you do internally, beta testing you do in a small group of people. Gamma testing is everybody. <laughs> you put it out there and you just start to see what the problems are and you start to see the patterns. And it's really hard sometimes to know what those are until a lot of people are using it. Um, but I, but the biggest problem is, is that you get these betas, but you have a couple months to do it and a couple of weeks. And there's a lot of things that and I, I used to develop software. So there was a lot of things that we would we would see coming. We can't get it fixed. You're then talking to Apple about trying to get it fixed. You're trying to figure out what's actually happening and then it's released. And so there's it just takes time to... Sometimes, and that's why usually, even if you're, I know Chris goes ahead of it, but Chris spends, I think, most of his time in Apple software. <laughs> so, 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 so the, and the Apple software definitely has an inside advantage. And so, so, but, but I, even when I upgrade to 14, because I'll upgrade to, I'll, I'll upgrade, but I usually don't ever have it set to automatic upgrade. And I usually give it at least a couple weeks to just kind of watch what happens, especially in the apps that matter to me. And especially when you start using really higher end 3D apps and, and um, visual effects apps, that's when you really want to stay behind because they've built a whole bunch of their own libraries to do a lot of things because the, the computers can't do that. And they're really, you know, prickly about moving forward. I mean, you can ask Abbott about that. I, mean, I think that people were using Mojave until like last year. So um, next question. Douglas Carmichael asks, uh, Ubiquity recently released the Unify Express, which has the Unify platform and a Wi-Fi 6 access point in a compact box. Could this be a viable solution for small studios or event sites, even with a one gigabyte Ethernet limit? Good guy. That's one gigabit. Uh, small b. Um, yeah, on that point, uh, right out the gate, the one gigabit doesn't really matter because that's what's coming in. Well, if you put on another switch attached to that, then you can go to, to 10G. But uh, of course, your your internal stuff just off that is going to be one gigabit. But this looks like a really exciting device. Uh, uh, after Douglas posted the question yesterday, I went to click this little buy now button. And of course, it's completely sold out and they're selling them for 100 bucks more on, on eBay. But yeah, you get the point that it's uh, you can put 60 devices um, I think it's really meant for like POS um, displays, uh, like people that are doing uh, enterprise grade it? stuff where you want to do site to site. But for 149 bucks, you get that ubiquity interface, you get the, your firewall. It, it does a lot. So I'm thinking about putting one in that Memo Live uh, kit that we were just showing, where that's the that's router. So you bring it in. You got your Wi-Fi. You could add additional. Um, units to to get additional Wi-Fi, but I like the Dream Machine just because of the flexibility, and it already has 10G built into it. So it's it's a bit more money, but it it depends on where you're going with it. If you want it portable and you have a small place, then this one for 149 bucks, done deal. You could add a second one, 149, 149. You're up to 450. What's Otherwise, the stateful big... transfer to uh, you know as far as the internet connectivity? So it, it's a one gig connection, but that's yeah. not what it's connecting to the internet. And so, like, for instance, the Meraki's, the stateful, I think is like 100 megs a second or two, 50 megs. It used to be 50 megs a second from like the Z3s. Um, does it, you know, in inside the VPN, what is the, what is the transfer rate? I'm not sure about the VPN, but to, uh, what it does, um, typically, if you have one gig coming in, it'll, it'll, it'll dish that back out. Uh, on the one that I have, you can actually bond to, so on the Ubiquity Dream Machine Pro, you have two internets and you can actually bond them together. So you could you could theoretically double the, depending on the mode that you have, either failover, so it's hard failover, or you can have it to where it bonds the two together. So depending on your speed, and it should theoretically Wi-Fi 6 deliver. Uh, I mean, I'm getting 600, I believe, on the Wi-Fi, 600 megabit on Wi-Fi 6. So it, yeah, it depends on... Uh, yeah. That's your device, your connecting device, if it's truly Wi-Fi 6. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, a guy covered it really well. It's, I see it's, it's designed for uh, companies that have a lot of stores in, in different malls and stuff in one city, and they want to link them all together to do their accounting and stuff on, on what's seemingly a local area network, but really a distributed uh, network. It looks like they've hired uh, the old tooling for the uh, Mac Mini Intel Mac Minis to do their... <laughs> to do their case design for them. And uh, I always wonder, Wi-Fi 6, I guess, is is such high frequency that you can put the antennas in the base. But if you have an aluminum thing like that with no external antennas, I wonder how good the coverage is going to be. They say 1,500 square feet for each access point there that you put in. And the access points can link locally <clears throat> over Wi-Fi. 
uh, or were uh, a land uh, in a single building uh, before without going out to the WAN. Uh, so it looks very interesting for 149 bucks. I think they're going to sell a lot of them. Yeah, and one of the things that we've used these these the Meraki's for a lot of times was just to connect our networks together. So, like for instance, um, you know, we put the little Z threes, and this this would be potentially a good replacement for that. It wouldn't be a replacement for a location. If you're doing a location, you're going to use a Dream Machine or you're going to use something else. I mean, you're, you know, you're not. I think the question was specifically, could these be used for small studios and event sites? Maybe a small studio, never an event site. Like event site, you'd go to a Dream Machine Pro or something like that, even if it was a small one. I mean, you really want a network that you can manage. But but what we put a lot of the Z3s into um, were basically, and the Z3s have modems in them. So we would, um, so they would, we... <laughs> Getting modems is a whole other thing, but that's a whole. And getting the, the the SIM cards is a whole other thing. But once you have them in there, it just meant that we could always get to them. We can always once they're plugged in, we can always get to that. Um, you know, touch it to be able to administer it and try to figure out what's going on if it's not connecting into the internet yet. And it could theoretically, I mean, if you have good coverage, you were able to just you could run a show out of it if you had to. Anyway, the um, but the main thing is those go out and those have gone out in every kit for a long time, and that just means that we can log into everything. They they have all the devices inside of them. They're all that are all in the DHCP uh, register, and so that way everything in every kit is always the same. You just tell me what kit it is, and I know you know I know which part of the of their IP. I just just change the the router number, but they're all, the endpoints are all the same, you know? And so, so it made it really easy for us to get to, administer them, do all the things that we needed to do. The other thing we would get into is you take, you, we'd have a, we'd have on the Meraki network, I'm not, the Unify should be able to do the same thing. We had a situation where we had a lot of graphics that need to be done for a big conference. It was, we didn't have a lot of space. So literally the conference was like, you can have this much space and we can't fit everybody in it. So we had to figure out where to put people. We put the entire graphics division at our office. So the entire graphics, so doing all the lower thirds, all the other bits and pieces, and they were literally punching all of the lower thirds into a black magic switcher 80 miles away or uh, 35 miles away. <laughs> 35 miles away, they were punching all of these lower thirds in from a nice quiet office. They're having their coffee, they're doing their thing, they're not in the they're not in the space, and they're able to completely administer all the graphics that were happening, you know, in that space. And that was 10 years ago, you know, like that. And so so the um so that's the kind of thing that you can do when you start to be able to connect something really inexpensive. This is a much better price than the Meraki stuff. It's like the Meraki stuff is $350 to start, and then you're paying some kind of membership, you know, it's that's not trivial. I mean, it, it it's not that much per year, but it adds up. <laughs> Keep on, you're like, I got to pay another $250 for each one of these. So, um, so anyway, uh, these look really great. I mean, I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm super interested in, in uh, built, you know, testing them because they could be a much more cost effective way to do a lot of those things. The thing that we get caught up in, and the reason I ask is that at least with the Meraki's, they weren't, they were, they, you could connect directly to the internet at full speed at the full, whatever you can have as far as internet access. But the stateful, like once you're inside the VPN had a limit. Um, and so I don't, if they don't have a limit, that's amazing. But the Meraki's were typically limited to something like, I mean, I think they're now up to 250, but they used to be like 50 and then a hundred. And, and the, so the stateful band uh, throughput is different than the absolute uh, throughput. And that, at least in the Meraki stuff, that's my, most of my experience. So that, that'd be the only thing that I'd be curious about. And their website is completely useless to me because I can't get to a spec sheet. Like they have this weird thing that I have to scroll through when I try to find it. Um, so, I mean, this is Unify. Um, I hate these web pages that, that you have to scroll up and down with these big pictures. And I, all I want is the spec. <laughs> like I just want the spec sheet. Uh, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, the other one to take a look at is uh, the GLI net uh, line. Those are pretty popular. I know um, our friend Greg Gibson, he uses it in his, his kits um, to be able to control his FR7s and have something that dishes out, uh, you know, IPs to each one. Um, if you added one of these Netgear 4250s to that Ubiquity, now you could still have, you know, your AV over IP, Mickey in the chat saying, you know, don't use Ubiquity for it. Yeah, I agree. So something like this, you can just say, I want these ones to be NDI. I want these ones to be Dante. So you could segment VLANs and you could have separate IPs. So you could have a, a 192 uh, scope on on uh, the Unify. And then in here, you can say, I want this to be 10.1.2, 10.1.3 and so on and so forth for your NDI and Dante devices. So this is about a $600 device and it'll just save you a lot of headache if you decide to go into the networking uh, audio and video over IP. So I, I'd strongly suggest taking a look at that line as well. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. 
Peter Rosado from Las Vegas, Nevada. iOS 17.2 introduced spa- spatial recording for Vision Pro. What are your thoughts? I've been playing with it a little bit. It, <clears throat> it one of the problems is, is that it's really sensitive. So it's like a, it's a very delicate thing. It's like, oh, there's not enough light. Oh, you need to be further away. Oh, you, like it, it's constantly telling you what you need to do to actually use it. But what you'll see, um, it's it, it's been in the beta for a couple months now. Um, but what you'll see is when you pick up your phone, you have to be in landscape mode. You can't do it in portrait because it, it depends on where the. Um, if we look at this, these. Uh, Let's see if, if we can put the, these two have to be next to each other like this. So it can't do it this way because there's no lenses that are next to each other. What's interesting is these are two different lenses. So it's doing some computational photography to figure out like to m- build two versions of it. Now what it does is it's recording one file. So it records a file and it's, it's, it is a, there's one hero eye, typically the left eye. And then there is a delta, which is the, all the other information that you would need to, to, to reconstruct the right eye. Uh, in 3D. Now, the the, um, the problem is I don't have a Vision Pro and there's not really any way to view it anyway other than the Vision Pro right now. So you're kind of shooting into the dark of you can, I have, you can send it to friends <laughs> and say, how does it look? You know, how, how am I, what am I doing? Is How does it, how does that look? Um, but the, um, the, uh, anyway, so, so the, you can do that. But, but what it's designed for is, that you, um, uh, you it's going to be designed as a as a product that will go right through your editing system. Now, it'll, obviously, the first one that will work with really well is Final Cut and Motion and so on and so forth, where those ones will be able to see that data really quickly. But it's designed for the, the content creator unless you want to dig into it. It's gonna, just going to look like a regular video file. So you're going to be able to edit it like any other video file, but it happens to have um, depth data or it happens to have two eyes. So not, it won't, I don't know if it'll do depth data when that would be super cool. I'm, I'm not sure if that, if it does that or not. Anyway, the point is, is that, and we'll see, my guess is, is that Final Cut will support it out of, you know, there'll be an, up, I think it, I think the update might have already happened with Final Cut. I'm not hundred percent sure where it supports that spatial data. Um, uh, but the next one will most likely be Resolve. Um, will be the one that does it, but I'm sure that Apple is talking to everybody about supporting this this um, this uh, format to get things through. People are trying to hack it. I don't think anyone has yet to get both eyes back, you know, so they can have both eyes to to do whatever they want to do with both eyes. But uh, I don't think that that's been successful yet. Um, but uh, it's pretty interesting. I would suggest if you're at a location and you're shooting stuff, if you've got a 15 and you've got um, you've got the new operating system, shoot a little bit of footage. You may decide you wish you had in the future. It's only 1080p, um, so it's not like a really really high resolution uh, video, but uh, it is. Uh, um, but I would you know it's it's going to be cool. Um, you know I think that uh, we just have to remember that again. I just want to keep on underlining the Vision Pro is not a hobby for Apple. Like Apple TV is a hobby. For, well, it was a hobby for Apple. The Vision Pro is is what I think they're going to spend a lot of time and effort on. It's worth getting your head around uh, what it looks like because Apple's probably going to put a little bit of effort into it. Um, uh, Next question. Incoming QR code question for Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Morning, everyone. Considering a Blackmagic Multiview 4 to get quad display on a 4K TV from Mac Minis, it would require Blackmagic converters to route. Would the panel recommend this workflow seeing the Multiview 4 is a little long in the tooth? Guy, yeah, there may be less expensive ways of doing this. Uh, maybe Mono Price or somebody has something that's in the HDMI world because yeah, you're going to have five forty five hundred forty five dollars to get a multi view that has SDI input. So you're going to spend what sixty bucks times four. Uh, me myself, this is what I use uh, for six nineteen. So just a little bit more, you get a monitor, an LG forty three inch that has quad input, and you can. You can take any one of these full screen if you want with the remote control. I think David Brady even fired it up to where he can do it over over another device. Uh, but yeah, this this is what a lot of people like Jeff Keithley, Paul Wallace, the, those of us that have got these really really like them a lot because six six hundred bucks and you don't have to buy a Demon Quad. So the they other were. option is a Demon Quad from um, Decimator, and that's going to cost you some money too. So. It just depends on what you're doing. Uh, NDI is another route of doing this. It depends on how far you're trying to traverse, where are those Mac Minis going to live. Uh, but yeah, myself, I'd get the get the LG. They during uh, Black the Black Friday they were four hundred and fifty dollars, four hundred and forty nine. I saw that. I was like, man, do I need another so one? So I know I didn't have the cash to do it. I was just like, ah, oh, can't do that right now. Go ahead, Courtney. 
Yeah, you know, the uh, I was going to recommend the Demon Quad. The uh, I I've had them, but they were they used to be four ninety five. Look at the price now; they're in stock at uh, three you know three hundred bucks two ninety five, and that takes uh, four SDI um, you know ten eighty p inputs and and outputs uh, over HDMI. It also has an HDMI input as well, uh, but um, uh, and they work pr pretty well. They have the LCD display on them. And for the two ninety five price, then you could just get some uh, Chinese made off eBay uh, HDMI to SDI converters, which yeah, generally will work just fine. Especially if you're just using them, you're not using them for color grading or anything. You're just using them for reference uh, before they go in and out of uh, your switcher or before they go in and out of a a router. Uh, so that might be a solution for you, Demon Quad. Yeah, and if you want to stick with HDMI, Monoprice makes a two hundred fifty dollars box that'll do four HDMI, four Ks, um, and be able to you can swap between them. You can have them all up as four up. You can hit select one and pop to it. Um, I don't know if it's as nice as the other ones. Um, I've definitely used it. I've had no problem with it at all. I'm not using it right now because I have this eight by eight, and the two of them don't like each other. So, <laughs> so, so the uh, um, they I have I've had a little trouble get, getting both of them to work well together, but. Um, even though they're both made by Mount Price. Um, anyway, but the but it's a four it's a four by one, so four in, one out. You can see splits. You can so then it turns any monitor into it. And as I remember, it's about two hundred fifty dollars. Uh, next question, Andy Kokendorfer from Vieira, Florida. I've noticed Dito lights on some sets and product shots. What makes them special? Go ahead, guy. Yeah, back in the day, these used to be really, really something to uh, aspire to, but they were super expensive because they were like little, little Fresnels. But they had the cool thing was if they had barn doors. So, what you want sometimes is the ability. Like right now, I have this hair light that's that's shining a nice little uh, sheen on my hair, and the way I'm doing it is with a, is with a similar light. This one's made by Felix, but you get these barn doors, and then you get the ability to dim it. So not only can you throw the light on it, but you can shape the light and. So this would be how it normally, and then I can shape it, and then I can dim it. So that's why Dito lights famous. And is that, uh, and is then that they bi also made some that you could? Is that bi directional? Go ahead, like, by by color. Yeah, this one is. Yeah. So it's hard to get uh, sometimes that pattern that you want exactly where you want it specifically for somebody's hair and shoulders. So a lot of times you'll see these things. Um, I can't really get it by myself, but right beneath the the shoulders. And that'll create a rim of light uh, for people that don't have hair. You don't want to put a hair light on them, so you'll you'll come down a little lower. And you'll hit it, hit their shoulder. So these kind of lights by Dito Light, Felix. There's a couple other manufacturers that make these hard sources Fresnel lights that you can vary the attachments that you stick on the front and focus that beam to get it exactly where you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, the call used to go out. Put a Dito on it. I mean, that was something we heard all the time, and they it was because they were small. And very focusable, like uh, Guy was saying, you could adjust the light uh, uh, beam patterns, etc. But for product shots, they were small, and get, they could get in these places that you didn't want to bring a big instrument in and, and light it up. So uh, they're still viable. It's just that they sort of fell out of favor as everything went made, uh, switched to LED. Good, Courtney. Yeah, everyone's right. They 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 go back to the '80s where they used to use like projector like bulbs, uh, incandescent bulbs, and they had such a small uh, head. I a lot of guys would use them for the the guys that shoot food photography. Always had Dito light kits because they could uh, focus and barn door and get that little slit of light just to light up the uh, grease on the hamburger, you know, a patty to get that uh, light to make it look just right. And so. Uh, they were great for product photography or tabletop photography or food photography. And plus, they had the, the benefit of using them, as, as uh, Guy said, for hair lights or you know rim lights, little things where you had to control them and you didn't want to generate a whole lot of heat. But nowadays, uh, since they're LEDs and dual color, uh, they're a lot more useful and a lot less hot. Yeah, and the uh, a a spherical optics um, it allows them to focus a little bit more. It's a patent pending or patent uh, based um, system, and that's one of the things that they have that's a little different than everybody else uh, to allow you to have a very pinpoint. Um, I still see them a lot on high end sets. You see a lot of other things on lower end sets, but on the high end sets, you see a lot of them. <laughs> you know, when people want to put things exactly where they want, especially in the ad world, um, in those types of things, it's it's. I don't see them as much on film sets, um, but I definitely see them a lot on when we're doing product stuff. Um, next question. 
Next question for John Foltz in Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. Has anyone found an inexpensive workflow to start recording on Blackmagic cameras using a Bluetooth device? Uh, the, the Your phones and iPads and Mac minis can, all can run the Blackmagic software, and that will, you can start rolling on the Blackmagic software there. Um, so the, I don't know what is inexpensive and what is expensive. I, I, you know, if you have a, a device that ha can run that app, then that will work. Um, to to make that actually happen, I don't have a blue, I don't have a black magic camera up right now, so it's hard for me to show you uh, that working. But it definitely will work. We we used it. We in the kits that we've sent out with Black Magic six Ks, we open up that software, and that's how we turn the cameras on, like get them get them rolling because they're remote. But we have a Mac Mini in there. That Mac Mini runs the software. It also runs um, uh, uh, Wingman for the for our Mix Pre. And so we have some control over those and see it also jumps into Zoom and does a bunch of other things. And so so it's inexpensive for us because it's doing a lot of things, um, but it is not necessarily the most inexpensive way to do that. Um, but if you have something there, it should be able to fire it off. Um, next question. Douglas Carmichael. Alex, you mentioned that you tend to hire technical people that work well with others. How should we as an industry integrate neurodivergent populations? Should we be mentoring them in the communication skills to work effectively with others? You know, it, it really depends on the person. I mean, I think that there are, um, you know, there are, it, it is, um, there are different ways to manage. I think this is kind of a ro rollover from last last week um, uh, or yesterday. We were talking about uh, uh, staffing and so on and so forth. And um, I think that uh, a lot of times, one of the things that we have found is we have fo folks that would work for us that remotely. And so they didn't really, they weren't really comfortable with, I mean, I found out that they really weren't comfortable with going, <laughs> like going to the set. They just weren't for a variety of reasons. They didn't want to go, go to a set and be on it. And so what, we had a lot of them working remotely and they were extremely effective. Um, they just didn't, we just didn't have them put, we just didn't put them in the, you know, in harm's way, you know, so to, so to speak. I think that if you are going to do that, you have to be very effective and very communicative, communicative and, you know, you have to really stand out technically to, to make that work, but it definitely has, uh, did work for us, um, you know, to make that, to make that ha actually happen for some members of our crew that, uh, again, we're not as specialized. The, 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 for our employer, someone who has a, you know, has some issues or some challenges, if you figure out how to get you know, have them be productive and effective and, and part of a team, um, man, you get a lot of dedication. <laughs> like, so it's, it's a really, you know, because you're, you're putting in that extra effort. So as an employer, that's usually actually a really uh, strong place to get people that'll really stick with you because you're working with them to make that actually happen. So it's a, it, it actually is a huge advantage for people who take advantage, who, who, who look at what that, that opportunity might be as an employer to be able to give people that opportunity and find a way that, you know, every person is, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be neurodivergent. Every person is a challenge in some way <laughs> and every person has assets in some way. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle and you're just trying to figure out what jigsaw, you know, sometimes we're just trying to bash people into the, into the hole that we had. But if you can figure out what that jigsaw is and you can figure out where people fit, um, every person has their own, has a pluses and minuses and you're just trying to find a place to take advantage of their, where, do, where can I put that person where they are going to be the most effective and I'm going to take away the things that they're not effective at and have somebody else do that <laughs> or how, or, or build a system that supports them. And so you're, you know, if you can figure out how to customize that, and sometimes you don't have the tools to do that. Like when I'm on set, I, I need, I need a certain tool set, but in, in the overall, as you build up a group, you can, like we were, we were lo really looking at, uh, right before we closed, uh, the Pixel Corps offices in DC, we were really, we were talking to a lot of veterans organizations about looking at veterans who had mobility issues, but were otherwise fine, you know? And I was like, I don't need, I don't need them to carry anything. <laughs> you know, like they can sit there and cut shows all day. So, you know, so we were really looking at how we customize our, our workflow to allow for that. And so, so those are, um, you know, those are definitely um, things that we, we think a lot about. And it's, it's a, it's a huge opportunity. Like I, uh, at um, at one of the companies we worked with, a lot of their custodial staff, um, you know, have have challenges, and they 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 love their jobs, <laughs> you know, like that, that that they have those things in there, and they um and they and they're very specific. I mean, man, they really run run me through the ringer over putting things in the wrong place. So um so so I think that there's a lot of it just depends on where where it all fits. Um, next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia asks, does the panel have any suggestions for me? I have a 24-inch monitor that is vertical 
and it was supposed to be part of a setup for Mimo Live on my Mimo Live machine. However, based on the way everything is working, there's no need for it. I go, Courtney. Well, you could unscrew those four screws on the VESA mount and turn it 90 degrees and then use it as a regular horizontal uh, 24. Or if you've got it plugged into a single computer, like a Windows computer or even your Mac computer, you can put uh, you can stack three 16 by 9 windows on top of each other, one atop the other, uh, to get three um, uh, three programs displayed on a single monitor in their standard aspect ratio of 16 by 9, if it's media playback or something like that. Um, but the problem with vertical monitors is if you're using them in a Zoom room or something where you've got a ca camera involved, uh, they might work good if you have a monitor below the camera, a monitor above the camera, and then two verticals on either side, and that give you a whole lot of screen space with the camera in the middle. Uh, otherwise, the problem is you're looking too far up or too far down on a vertical monitor, so it moves your eye line too far off uh, the camera. So um, I'd use it judiciously if you're using it in the Zoom room, but as I said, if you need to use it for displaying multiple programs at the same time, uh, it'd come in handy in the vertical mode by stacking the windows three three high. You can never have too many monitors. Like, it's just impossible. Like, I, I'm constantly trying to figure out where I put the next one. Uh, so clocks, um, extra data, uh, other things that you're working on, things that you're, you know, there's always think more things to, to display. <laughs> so so um, I wouldn't worry about it, but I, but I definitely think I, I put a lot of, my work notes, you know, my show notes, uh, all those, you know, all those things are are things that I that I throw into those vertical vertical mon or I throw into monitors in general. I don't have a lot of vertical monitors. I tend to keep them all the same because a lot of them have to go back into my switcher. So as a result, I, they all stay in a sixteen by nine aspect ratio. Next question, David Brady from New York, New York has a question. What are some practical applications for Stream Deck Plus with Companion? Uh, Mitchell. Um, I find it absolutely dedicated and perfect uh, working companion stream deck with my mix effect. Um, it just uh, expands an already great program into something that's so usable right there in front of you. I'm just looking forward to the uh, the feedback. Now, are you uh, using it with the function. Stream Deck Plus? That's with the with the rotary dials on across the Ooh. bottom. Yeah, that's what he's Cut asking me on that for. One. I'm using the 32 to, yeah. button. Sorry. Yeah, he's trying to figure out the. You know, I, mean, I think I think we all know how to make the Stream Deck work well. It's it's what do we do with those rotary rotary dials uh, when it comes to the companion? Go ahead, guy. Yeah, they're showing at uh, IBC in the vMix booth the ability to use those dials to position so you could turn, uh, rotate them and move graphics left, right, up, down. So, I mean, I'm just using one with, with vMix myself, uh, not the not the plus, but uh, this is how I cut. When you see, you know, I'm able to cut to, let's see, I'll hit fade. And so that's how I can cut over to But that. are you using, but, but have you have you used the, the, I think he's asking specifically about the companion, the, the Stream Deck Plus. Have you? So I don't have the plus, but that's what I was saying was that at IBC, they showed uh, one great use case is that ability to position. So I would say, unless you need it, the old one's uh, working fine. But yeah, I've seen people want to use it for um, color as well. In that vMix uh, demo, they showed how you can adjust saturation, uh, hue, and things like that. So I think that's one of the, the main purposes besides uh, audio level. Yeah, I, I have to admit that the the main use that I've had for it is like there are some custom builds by si I think it's called Side Effects um, that build them for it. So I'm not using them with Companion. Uh, I think it's SideEffects.com and uh, let's see here, Side Effects. Let's see, not Side Effects. Side Effects makes Houdini. Um, uh, let's see here. Hold on. Uh, uh, Stream Deck. Sorry, we're going to slow this down for just a second because I want to. Um, there is a company that make oh Sideshow Effects, um, I believe is the is the name of it. Yeah, so Sideshow Effects, and I've bought probably more than I should have from these. These what they do is they build um, they build they. So this is not a companion solution, um, you know, for for that. But what these guys do is they build lots and lots of pre built. Um, systems so that you know you can run it, and I bought them for Logic as well, which is really hard to install in my opinion. <laughs> but but also, um, but you can so you can build a lot of these tools 
um, they, they really customize it with all the icons and all the setups and every, and all the behaviors that you want. Um, and so, uh, and so you have, if you look at the store here, you'll see kind of all the different applications that they, they build these for. It's a really interesting business that they've gotten themselves into everything from Cinema 4D to Affinity Designer and Photos to After Effects to Illustrator. And you can, it, and they build all the connections of the things that you, you can build this yourself. But the reality is, if you let them do it, they'll build most of the things you need. It. <laughs> you know, I found them to be really, really useful. But everything that I'm doing with my Plus is related to pre-built things that they built for me. Um, it'd be interesting to have them build something for Companion where it's tying back into that because they're really good at what they do. Um, yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, here's a walkthrough where uh, John Barker shows how he was able to tie it into an ATEM where he's got volume up and down and... And then he's he built it in in companion to where he shows how he uses that dial so that you could rotate it and latch it to Fairlight so that it, in your ATEM you you're able to rotate now. And I'll that's put a, great. I'll put a link to that. So that's another example of just something that you might if you're an ATEM user you might want to use it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question. Robert Sababody in Poland, is Google really serious about faking the Gemini-based video? Was it just a hedging fun hoax, or hoax, or is this Google's modus operandi? Uh, Good, Courtney. I think they were just trying to get ahead of things by showing what the capabilities of Gemini will be. Although they, in their demo, they they did a thing and they did not. I don't think during the live demo they did not post a disclaimer, but when they uploaded it to. Uh, Uploaded it to YouTube for later. There was a little small disclaimer at the bottom that the the um, response times had been shortened. I mean, people have been doing this in commercials for years. I mean, we've I've worked in commercials. So was the only thing years. that they that they that they disclaimed was that the response times were slower than what they showed. The other thing is that the responses were in text and they vocalized them later. So the okay. real time responses that you heard as a synthesized voice. It, you know, it responded in text, and later they converted that text to voice uh, to for the demonstration. Uh, I think it will. It is multimodal input and multimodal output, so it will eventually be able to do all of that stuff. But I don't know if they have it all up and working in a in a time, you know, in a reasonable amount of time to respond with. And it's hard to do a demo where you you see it doing something, and twenty seconds later, it, it figures out what you're doing and and gets it correct. But in a live demo, that's death, you know. So yeah, um, I, I don't know. They maybe. cheated, <laughs> definitely yeah, cheated. Sure. But I think it's capable of doing all that. And all the response they said that all the responses were the real responses, yeah. And all the prompts were the real prompts, just converted to text. Uh, text to voice was was uh, shortened, you know. Yeah, I uh, as someone who does works on a lot of keynotes and it's like. Oh. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah. like, 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 you, don't you, want just, you just sped it up. You, like we, we've done ones where we have, comp, like we, we have, we've had comp, um, keynotes where the set of, uh, the set of things that you have to do, it can do it, but the set of them is very complicated to do. And then what we did is we just recorded it. We recorded it 10 times, found the one that we could do it at that speed. It's not that you can't do it. It just can't do it. It's hard to do perfectly every single time without making a glitch. And so we would just record it and then we would play it back as the person was clicking or looking like they were clicking on stage. Yeah. Um, it's not that the product didn't do it and it's just that you want to make it a nice clean, um, you know, process. And that's super common, <laughs> like, like, you know, and so, yeah. so you shouldn't, you, you know, like, like the, uh, and, and cutting time, we cut time all the time, like, like all the time. Um, and we very rarely um, talk about it during a show that we, that we've been, and, and now it's, it's, it's like the, we call it a Julia Child's move. I mean, literally it's a Julia Child's process, um, you know, when we do that. So I don't, I don't think that this is, there's not a lot of, they also the said, they also said that some of the stuff, which is shown as video, like the guy you know, drawing the duck here, you know, mm -hmm. he's got his hands in front of the paper and it's showing, I see you're drawing, you know, it looks like you're drawing a, a bird of some sort. And then he draws the water and he said, oh, you're drawing a duck that they presented it with still in it. You know, they took the right. hands away so it's not confused by the hands. But, uh, but I wonder, cause they did demonstrate sleight of hand and the cups and balls, you know, which yeah. cup has the ball under it. So it's gotta be monitoring video to follow that. So yeah. I think there is some truth in, in that it's, if it's, it's not just still images that were submitted. Uh, yeah, uh, analyzed. 
I think it's probably pretty close to what they what it can do. <laughs> like it's pretty. I don't think that they were, uh, and and if it's not, it will be soon. I mean, like n- there's nothing I saw in the Gemini demo that I was like uh, that that was it was great, but it didn't. It wasn't like you landed a seven forty seven and we only had biplanes. I mean, it was like a slightly better you know plane than what I saw before. So it's it's. I mean, but it definitely shows you what's possible and what's coming. Next question. Next one in from uh, Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York. Has anyone had any experience using the newer PTZO Optics uh, camera management platform? What are your thoughts on the auto tracking software? Good guy. I haven't got to play with it yet, but uh, uh, as I was looking at it, I was reminded that we had these guys on for a second hour after CES. So last year, I saw this in the booth and uh, I was so excited about it because they were showing us walking around, you know, just on the trade show floor and it was tracking really well. And uh, I was standing next to Jeffrey Powers. And so we were playing a little hide and seek, you know, trying to confuse the thing. And it, it actually worked really well. I mean, so well that uh, I said, hey, you guys should show this stuff off on, on office hours. And they, they came in, but I'm going to download this because I have one PTZ optics camera right behind me to test it out on. So if you follow up this question again later in the week, I'll download it uh, after the show and throw it on here and see if we can uh, see what it, dig into it and see what it looks like. Next question. Next one from Carlos Ronconi from San Jose Dos Campos. Any comments about the Road Mackey acquisition? Go ahead, Courtney. I think they did a good thing. Uh, I, they're trying to gain a market share over Behringer. Behringer, you know, has captured a whole lot of that low end market of mixtures. And Road and Mackey were competitors in that same uh, area. And so Mackey had been falling, you know, over the years. Uh, because the, their analog mixers were, you know, great, and Rode was very good at, at doing the digital mixers, and so it's a good combination, I think, to to combine the what's left of the Mackey line and the Rode line to compete against Behringer, who's competing in both of those areas. So I think it's a smart move. Yeah, I think the manufacturing quality of of Mackey's, the hardware itself is great, but you know we're all pa- going past analog mixers. I mean, other than really really big ones, and for specific reasons. Uh, I would never put an analog mixer into into my pipeline. Uh, next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael asking, when is it better to use a crewing agency for finding and managing freelancers versus hiring them directly? Mitchell? Um, I used to use cruise control. They were kind of big, I guess, out of Washington, a lot of freelancers. And I had very good success with them. Don't know if they're still around. But uh, the idea of hiring another group that uh, that pays attention to the details is great because it's just a line item for a small organization like mine. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different uh, aspects to that. One is, of course, finding people for you. So especially when we go into a new location, where we don't have a lot of people. Sometimes you do lean into crewing agent, you know, a crewing partner to make that actually happen. Also, sometimes they're they're managing all of your um, uh, all the payroll. So payroll is a big deal. Um, being able to manage all the payroll, the taxes, the things for that lo- location, and so you're just getting a one. As Mitchell said, you're getting a one line off, you know, line item. Um, but you're and you don't have to think about all the extra paperwork. So if you haven't done work, especially in that state, it's better to use oftentimes using some kind of crewing or payroll agency to manage that for you. Um, the the other side of that, I mean, for the most part, I only do it when we have to. Like we can't find people, we'll go to a crewing. It's much more expensive generally to do, and you have a little bit less control over how you do it. Um, and so usually we're building. You know, part of what a production company does is start to build up rolodexes and. If I'm, you know, when I come to a site, I don't, I don't do anything on site anymore. <laughs> so, so, I, so I sit around and complain about things and watch processes. But one of the big things that I do down there is if I'm sitting on site, I'm identifying the people that I want to keep and not keep. And there's usually on any given thing, there's people that, oh man, I got to have those people on the next shows. There's some people that are like, oh, no, sure. And then there's people like, we're never going to call them again. And so, so the, and, and, and hopefully you don't have to tell them that during the show. We've had a couple where we've had to go, you got to go home now. Um, but, uh, but the, uh, but generally it's like, uh, you know, do not, you know, do not call. They get on a do not call list. And usually it has to do with them being edgy or chatty, chatty. I, I hate chatty uh, crew. So I don't like people talking about non of uh, non things, non show things at the show, so um, so that that usually gets you a pretty low on the list pretty quickly, um, and so uh, um, so anyway, so that those are the kind of things. But but we try to build that rolodex as as fast as we can. Um, and, and in most large cities, we have a pretty good one, and we'd rather do that than crew. But sometimes you get pinched, especially when all your great freelance. If you have great freelancers. It's hard to get them. You don't. You know. You get a call for something ten days out, and they're all booked because they're 
under on you know the high demand because they're really good. Uh, next question. And it's from Chris Fenwick in Half Moon Bay, California. And here in our panel, I just discovered a feature in Keynote that I never knew existed. Can I share? What did you find, Chris? This might be completely yeah. uh, uh, well known. So uh, my Mac mm -hmm. Mini here has the, the Zoom ISO set up in it. And um, so it has five displays. It has the primary uh, mm -hmm. user interface plus four outputs. If you fire up Keynote and start a slideshow with a whole bunch of displays, you get so many options. You get so many options. So <laughs> I have the, the, the program output. Right. I have the coming up next slide. Yep. I have the, hey, this is what you're looking at and this is what's coming up slide. Yeah. And I even have the speaker notes. Like yeah. everything, and the fifth display, which I can't show you because it's not piped into my system here, it just has the clock going. Yeah, I was going to say, I was about to say, you're missing the clock. The clock is there. Everything, yeah. everything shows up on its own display. Blew me away. And what, what was, and, what, what kind of bummed me out is before I had the, um, before I had the note that said, uh, you know, this is speaker notes in there, at first glance, I went, ah, oh, is that, is that the Alpha Channel? <laughs> it's, not. <laughs> it's not it's just speaker notes. like why can't it be but yeah, right it could be yeah. but um i cool. did not know that it broke out and i wonder i don't know what the priority is like if i only had you know three displays, you can define which... them so you can you can there's a you can define all of them so you can say this is where i want this in fact you can move thing parts of it around you can say this i want this to be ordered or i want this to show up or i want these to be on this monitor so in inside yeah there's you can move a lot of that stuff around and decide which monitors are getting what um, this is because of confidence monitors or, or in, sure. in Europe, comfort monitors um, that are all down below the, the stage. And so down below the stage, you need to have you, you want to, you know, you want to have a full screen of what's coming next. You want a full screen of what's and you want all of those integrated. And, you know, Keynote has been in most of the major events. You know, again, I've said this before. People give us something else and then we go, hey, is it OK if we. Uh, you know, we're going to prep these for the for the show and we're going to, you know, conform them and conforming them means we're going to take your PowerPoint, and put it into Keynote, unless you're Microsoft uh, recently. <laughs> so, so anyway, so so the um, uh, so the um, so but Keynote has all these tools because a lot of um, presentation and of course you have Apple uses it for their own products and they're pretty picky. And the folks that run, I think the folks that run the their stuff that know a lot about presentations. <laughs> so they, so they, they, it's nice when you have a developer that, and, and they're, and so they've, they've added all those to be fair. I think that, I don't think slides has as many. I do think that PowerPoint has a lot of these tools built into it as well. Um, because it's used in the, in the same way. I don't think it always had it. And I don't know if they work as well. I haven't used them for a long time, but I know that there's a couple different slide options in PowerPoint. So to be fair, I, I don't think it's necessarily only in Keynote, but you don't see it unless you add more monitors. Like it doesn't, it's completely invisible to you until you add a bunch of monitors and then suddenly it's up there and you're like, when you get into the monitor, uh, when you get into the display options, you know? That's yeah, cool. yeah. I've, ne I've never launched it on this machine before. And uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I remember the, the day that Keynote was announced, it was at a Macworld. Uh, they were still doing Macworld. They were streaming on the internet. It was, it was a really big deal. And the first slide transition happened, and I went, that's not PowerPoint. Yeah. That, that was not, what, what, what are they, what are they, because I mean, in the early 90s, I used to yeah. have people fly me all around the country to make PowerPoint prezo. So I, I knew PowerPoint pretty well. Yeah. And, uh, I think like, that's I think interesting. The, the big thing for me was when I when I really became angry about PowerPoint went to went to keynote was because I did a presentation actually for Microsoft in Houston, Texas or whatever and uh it was all videos. It was very little text or whatever in in the presentation, but it had of course had to be in PowerPoint. It was on a PC. I spent more time getting the videos to work in this is 2000. Um, I spent more time getting the videos to work in PowerPoint than I did actually working on the presentation itself. And I was just like, oh, this is, and Keynote came out and you just dragged things in and it was all worked, you know. And next question. The, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. I was going to, uh, never mind. Next question. Two sidebar. Kieto Flaud, Griswold from Tromso, Norway, asking, we have tried DaVinci Resolve's AI auto caption to generate subtitles for the timeline. Then we exported the subtitles as an SRT file and uploaded it to a chat GPT-4 to proofread and correct spellings. Not happy of the results. Any tips? Good, Courtney. 
Uh, don't use chat GPT as your uh, for as your output because I think you know what a large language model does is it creates um, uh, logical sentences based on t- statistics of what what are correct words following correct words. I don't know Norwegian, so I'm not sure what you were unhappy with, but uh, you can have chat GPT four say the same thing four times and it'll be different each time. So if you want uh, your subtitles to be accurate, if the subtitles are in the same language as the spoken on camera stuff, if they're just closed captioning uh, without translation, people might get upset if the subtitles don't match what the person is saying and they understand both languages. So maybe that's what you're running into that is a problem. Uh, It will correct the spellings, but it may not say the same words in the same order as the person said, because it, it bases it on its, its large language model of, you know, conveying the idea, but not necessarily in the same words. I have to say, I I did have chat GPT. I, I wrote a letter that I needed to write. And then I asked Chappie GPT to write it better. Like just to improve, what would you do to improve this letter and rewrite it? And it wrote it and it was so much better than what I wrote. And I was just like, it, it was kind of scary. It, it kind of frightened me of how, how amazing it, 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 it broke it down. And it was so much better structured than what I had written. And it took all my stuff and put it all in different places. Like it, it didn't just like clean up a couple of sentences. It like rebuilt it. Like I was, it's, it is a, it's a kind of an amazing thing. Uh, next question. From Robert Sababody in Poland. Has anyone tried running Mimo Live on the same Mac as Zoom ISO and using the Zoom ISO outputs as Mimo Live inputs? This will also allow for ISO recording. There you go, Chris. So, Robert, if you do try this, whatever you do, don't open up your Amazon wish list at the same time. I mean, this... This definitely falls into the category of you might be trying to do too much on one computer. So I know I haven't tried it though. I do this every week for, this is how I use it with Michael Krasny's show. So I have a Zoom ISO open. Um, I pop it open. It delivers audio via loopback to um, to uh, audio hijack to record the, I, put, I just put the two participants in left and right channel, send it there. I'm also sending audio to a mix pre, so it's getting the local mic as well as the remote mic. I'm then cutting the show, you know, during, during that, in, you know, so I'm cutting the show in memo, streaming it out, and I'm at like maybe 50% capacity or 50, 55% on a studio, um, but it totally works. And, and, I, and I tested it over this earlier, earlier this week over doing it, literally adding all the records, also the ISO records and, and all the things, and I'm now up to, um, I, this is where I'm up to like 53% of, capa- of utilization. So it totally wow. works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's pretty efficient. And uh, have you have you opened up your Amazon? Wish I did list? not open up my Amazon wish list. I will admit, when I do this, I restart. I then I cut. I close everything else that could be possibly running, except for Chrome, which is actually a pretty big thing. Um, uh, but I, I I leave Chrome open because I have to manage. Uh, I'm looking at the questions coming in live. So the good takeaway for this, I know we're at the top of the hour. The good, the good takeaway from this is as you do these things, test like literally one layer at a time. Don't hours add two of, or three things. I got, I got it working on the show and, and I, but test for hours, you know, like it's yeah. not, it's not even just test a little bit, but I've been testing for hours to make that work yep. and, and finding all kinds of problems. And then you know, oh, I got to figure this out. Um, usually Saturdays are the days that I do that. <laughs> Saturday afternoons, I'll spend, I spent like four hours this last Saturday kind of rebuilding how it works and the graphics and the ISOs and everything else. Um, but that's usually Saturday afternoon is usually my time to, to figure that out. Uh, next question. Next question in from Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. Just checking in to see if there's still a process for getting a 1080 Zoom account. Is it possible from a pro account or is a business or enterprise necessary? I go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I was a little confused on this one myself. I thought that there was an, out, an announcement last month that uh, they were opening it up to everybody, but it still says on the site that it's been updated here uh, last month in November. But I got burned bad on Sunday, um, a webinar. I'm still angry because I had to re-edit something today because it should have just been able to be a shared recording via Zoom. But instead, I produced a nice 360p webinar, and I am not happy because the account that it was on was not mine and it was somebody else's and I was assured it was an HD account and it was 360p. The bummer was that we were using that to transmit to overflow rooms. So I got to produce a show in 360p and it was glorious. Um, I do believe that this, if you have the sessions license, you, you can get to 1080p, but I'm not a hundred. So I think you have to buy the sessions, yeah, sessions license. Yeah. If you 1080p. have a v- Zoom events, then all that is, is uh, 1080. 
So, right. and, but I think way, you don't even need all it. of Zoom events. I think you just buy the sessions. Yeah. Um, a add on. So that's it's, I think it's a hundred bucks or something like that to, I think it's a hundred dollars a year or something like that. To, but as far as uh, Jack getting his, I would just try and make the request right now. I think they've loosened up the purse strings on that because, you know, it's a bandwidth issue. And during COVID it was expensive because they had- You can definitely get so a 720, users. but the 1080, I think requires you to pay for it. Yeah. The 720 is free though, if you ask. Um, uh, we are about to jump into the second hour. Uh, just a quick reminder, Wednesday, we have the X32 Lab. Uh, Thursday, we're building LUTs. Friday, we're going to talk about power. Uh, Saturday, of course, is our R&D um, and Q&A. And Sunday is introspection. So uh, those, are, those are the things that are coming up. Of course, we have also the lab coming up uh, at noon. The question was really, how quickly can I put all those things together as we answer the question a little longer? <laughs> anyway, so uh, just a quick reminder, of course, that that uh, uh, we do have a lab at um, at, at noon uh, Pacific Standard Time and 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, learning how to do, be a panelist and do all these other things, you can jump in then. Uh, we're really glad to have Alex Golner back and we're going to talk about uh, lower thirds. Uh, we, we talked, I promise that we'll actually talk about lower thirds today. Uh, last time there were so many great questions that we didn't actually get to the process. So we're not gonna explain anything about motion now other than just how to how to jump into it. But we're, uh, but Alex Golner's back and Alex, you know, for all of you watching, if you didn't watch last week is just one of the most technically amazing motion users in the world um, and has an incredible amount of, of broadcast background. And so it's just really an honor to have Alex here to show us how he puts these things together and how we get them through there. So welcome back, Alex. It's great to see you again. Um, but also, if you do have any questions about lower thirds, we can ask them a little bit later. But we, Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> if you have other questions, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we get through what we promised um, about, you know, to show you the actual mechanism of this. But if you have questions about motion, or if you have questions about uh, lower thirds and the creation and, and the getting them into Final Cut and everything else, go ahead and throw those questions in. Of course, you can use uh, Mukana, uh, but you can also, and ask those questions, um, you can also use the QR code and you just go to, go to askofficehours.global. So, and you can ask questions all day using that. Um, so go ahead and, and use either one of those. We'll keep our eye on both of them. But if you have those questions, go ahead and throw them in. Um, we will get to them, um, but we're gonna get be pretty focused for the moment on getting uh, to making sure that we actually show you. So, so Alex, I'm going to throw it over to you and have you kind of walk us through how you build these inside of motion. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, just to remind you, I'm not a trainer, but I know some stuff. Um, so I'll just keep on stumbling through, not necessarily having too much of a demo ready, but just make stuff up as I go along, uh, but not go too far. And then if you've got any questions, I'll try doing different things. And at least that's my unplanned plan. It's perfect. It's perfect. So I'm going to share my screen and then we're going to see uh, what we get um, in terms of, can you see my cursor? So um, here we are in Final Cut. Can you see my cursor? It's so big. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's good. It's good. We can definitely see your cursor. Yes, definitely. So here we are in Final Cut. And um, I'm the kind of person that has lots of <laughs> categories of titles here because I like lots of titles. And as you can see, I do make some for the BBC as well as other people. So um, a, a shortcut to hide all this stuff is to do that. So you don't have to see that. So here we are in Final Cut and we want to add a lower third there. So I'm just gonna st switch straight to motion. Here we are in motion. If you choose new, uh, you get a new file. I'm gonna choose a Final Cut title. Keep it relatively short, maybe something like uh, four seconds long. And I'm gonna do 25 frames a second because I'm in the UK. So. You can make other things in motion, but we're making a title, which is a uh, lower third is a kind of uh, title. So here we are, as we saw before, it defaults to showing some text over here. I'm going to make this a little narrower and I'm going to move. And for that title background, that's just here. reference, right? So if you're putting a title, if you put something in the title background, that's just so you can see something or is it, does that actually go out? Well, the thing is that this does go out. This clip here, if I, mm -hmm. this represents whatever uh, layers or other clips with the titles on top of. So right. if I animate this title, say for example, over time, I'll just get this thing playing. And if I move this thing around, I'm it'll not move the whole video. it'll actually move the whole video behind the title. So right. it's actually a way, if you like, of animating. So your title actually affects the clip in the background. And it does not even just the whole clip. We can get a mask it and use part of the clip and blur it, for example. So I could select this part here, the lower part, and blur it if I like to. So this defaults to whatever duration I chose, and it says type text here. 
And the idea is sorry. I so know. I just I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to interrupt sure, you there. Let's do you it. said something that was really important that I just didn't think of before of using this because I usually think of these as just titles. Mm. So you could take the background and you can do all kinds of effects to it, right? So you could do so that that image says if you're going to throw that title over top of that video, I could blur it. As you said before, but you could also darken it, apply other mm. other other things. You could could you do all of those things to it? Sure, absolutely. So I've got the title uh, background selected at the moment, and I can choose make clone layer or press the K key. Now I've got a clone of that layer, mm. and usually I apply effects to the clone. So let's go to blur, and let's do a nice uh, defocus, which is more like a kind of lens blur type thing. Mm. And I've got this. Control here. I can choose, let's say I'm going to have all the parameters of this effect here. Right. Sorry, filter. And I'm going to publish them all, which means that they'll be available in Final Cut Pro. Right. If you don't publish them, so, and, and, and this is this is the important part, if you don't publish them, when they go over to Final Cut, they won't be there. So, so you can say, I want these settings to be a certain way, and I mm -hmm. want them to go into Final Cut, and then um, I don't want uh, the editor as the editor, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to accidentally tweak it. And as mm. the creative director, I don't want my editors changing those things. <laughs> I want them. I want those things to make, stay the same. I want to give them what they need to to be effective. I don't want to give them more sliders than they need to get something Absolutely. done. Yeah. yeah. So this is more the you play, have a go with the kind of footage in Final Cut if you like, or you can do it the footage here. But if you want to just have a fun tool to play with, then you publish everything. Uh, so this is more about the motion graphics people amongst you, I would say. But and also though, you could build a mask. So for instance, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to do this, but you, you, with the the clone that you're doing there, you could mask it. Or is that what you're going to do now? Let's crop it. Yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do something quite simple. So I'm gonna show the crop tools. And then I'm going to make it so you can publish the, I'm going to publish the top crop. Mm -hmm. So, and then I'm going to, of course, that range isn't very good. You notice how the range here is not great, right. but we'll come back to that later. So I'm going to crop it to about there. So if I select the project layer, it shows, and I click project, it shows me the controls that I got from defocus, the amount, the gain, the shape, the aspect ratio, the crop, and also this is the crop of the actual, the area. So I'm going to say um, blurred area. So I can just select any of these parameter names and give them more sensible names because otherwise they, they may not make sense to the person actually using it. So I'm going to very quickly choose um, save and I'm going to create a, give it a name, which is like um, lower third. Oh, and I can give it a theme, which means it'll appear in one of those groups that you saw earlier in Final Cut. So I'm going to choose new theme, and I could type in one here, but as you can see, I've got too many of these already. In fact, I do have one already called Silly. Now let's try if there's one called Office Hours. No, so I can do Office Hours. I thought I did. Um, so. So it's useful to divide your uh, title templates into groups sometimes. So um, actually, I was doing the wrong thing. Let's forget this theme business because it's too irritating to explain. It's a category. Uh, I'll come back to that later. So category office hours. So I just click publish and nothing seemed to happen. But if I go back to Final Cut, and Final Cut's open. It's not like you had to close it yeah. and shut it or reload anything. It's just there. So here we are. Um, we've got a lower third O. I can double click it to attach it to the timeline here. And you can see there's a bit of blurring happening here. So I need to find a bit where, yeah, I can see it more clearly at this section here. But it's quite a subtle blur. So what I can do, the controls that you saw earlier are going to be in this tab up here. So this is what you published. Parameters. Yeah. So I'm going to blur a lot more. And if I run out of space here, I can drag upwards and keep on blurring and blurring and blurring like this. Um, and I can choose, this is where I'm, remember that thing that kind of crop tool? So I've got yeah. this kind of choosing the area, how much to crop up the top. We'll come back to this later maybe. But as you can see, this is not a Gaussian blur. This is a proper lens blur. Um, so I can because any of the effects, the motion engine, yeah. anything in the motion engine is the same processing that's happening in Final Cut, right? 
Yes. So essentially all the things you see in Final Cut actually were made, nearly all of them, 99% of them were made in motion. All the titles and effects and stuff like that were uh, titles and filters in, final, in, in motion. So I can change some quite nice effects with this blur here. And uh, let's say I've got a polygon. I want it to be um, a square and I can rotate 90 degrees. Now you can't see some of these things here. So I can... Let's zoom in here and move over to this thing. Okay. So this is the principle of what's called a placeholder. So essentially what we were going with there was the fact that if I go back to uh, motion, this is the title background placeholder. And it's whatever whatever footage and clips are underneath um, in, in, the, in the below. So I don't know if I've got much media in here. Um, it's me being lazy. Yeah, I don't really have any footage. But let's say, for example, I create another, um, get a generator and put something in there like, a, I don't know, I got a grid somewhere, I think, just for me. And it will notice it's, it's blurring. below it. Yeah, everything below it, like that, which... Right. Yeah, so it's, it's essentially all all this combined together is comped together, and then it's sent to this title. Uh, yeah. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to show the lower thirds here and how this works inside of Final Cut is this is a superpower that almost nobody knows exists. I mean, there's just so few people that use motion for these these titles and just don't understand like how deep and how powerful the title generation stuff is. I mean, you, you know, this is the way to build titles for Final Cut. <laughs> you know, so. Yes. I mean, of course, I'd love it if uh, motion templates and they had an extension for uh, Media Composer on the Mac. That would be amazing. And, a good, and uh, I strongly suggest Apple should do that. Um, so now it is possible with this title background here. If I see if I can find this media, uh, that'd probably be a good idea. I can actually temporarily um, reveal in browser. Let's see where this actually. Well, I'm going to try drag it straight into motion. I don't know if you can even do that. It looks like you can't. <laughs> That's the thing. I might as well try something new. You never know what you're going to yeah, get. Because, you know, we're only, you know, in a show, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what I can do is drag this straight into the background. And this is now being used. Any footage I like can be used as this background. So I can actually but that, could have but, done this but, here. But when you save that out, that won't be part of the export, right? That title no. background. That's just for reference. No. That's just for me to be able to do what I need to do. So this is so we can see what we're doing. And say, for example, this type is a little light, especially if it was over here. But with this title background, I can always clear it, and it goes back to what, I would, what would be the default. So um, notice, so we've got this clone layer up here um, selected. I go to properties, and I've got this crop parameter. Remember, it was called top. And it kind of varies in a kind of weird way that the number starts at zero up here, which is much too high, much too low. And effectively, say you wanted to go the other way, say you wanted this to... And um, you're using crop here, but you could use a mask, right? That way you could, in, and theoretically, soften that mask. Yeah. Um, so the crazy thing is... Um, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I could I, I, I could use a rectangle as a mask instead um, mm. and then change the blur on that or change the parameters on the blur. So uh, let's say if I go to this, I can choose to unpublish that. Got the clone layer. I'm going to uncrop that. And then I can add a mask. So let's... Hard to see, of course, because um, it's it's a mask of the same. All I can do is make this invisible so I can see what how I'm working. And then I can select the mask. And then these could be published, for instance. So I could... But yeah, there you have like a, you could publish the feather so you can make it so it's not like a straight line across that you could blur it, but it's blurred, you know, that, that effect is blurred into... Yeah. So I could... And the question is, you know, make this move with a type and do other things like that are more tricky, but possible to do in terms yeah. of um, make the blurred area and the background move with, the, with this text box. Because we've got this text box here and we've got this rectangle mask. And it's interesting, if you look at these anchor points, they're kind of similar. But you could like move the anchor point to the bottom and then scale, you know. Sure. So say here's, 
Here's a tip. Um, behaviors are very powerful things. Um, essentially, what people like in After Effects is they like to be able to link one thing to another um, using a pick whip. So I've got this rectangle mask and it's got this position. Um, so if I say, OK, I want to link this parameter, the position of this rectangle mask to the actual text box. I'm dragging this on here. And now the advantage is if I move the text box, this moves with it. OK, so what I can do with this mask now, go to the mask and I can choose the size, let's say. Let's say I want to mess with the height of this. So let's make it uh, 200. And I'm going to um, publish this. In order to make this kind of clearer, what I'm doing, I'm just going to select the clone and I add another filter to it. And I can choose I don't know, something simple like brightness. And then I can darken it a little bit. So I can say uh, 0.7 and publish that. So to go back to what we the parameters available in the project, we've got all this stuff to do with the blur. Let's get rid of that one because we're going to unpublish it. And this is a uh, blur area height. Because that is the height of this rectangle mask and the brightness of the area. So I might want to move these to the top. So these are more important. So you can just drag them to the top. And then it's probably a good idea to call this, to give these na better na names so you know what you're doing, but I won't rename all those. And also it's a good idea to link, uh, to rename these what are called behaviors. So same um, pause as text, text layer. <laughs> anyway, let's go to this. I'm going to choose save just as it is. And then if I go back to Final Cut Pro. It's already done, right? Like it's, it. if you update it, you don't have to, I mean, if you, it, it'll just update what it's doing, right? Yeah, so I'm going to go to, this is, it. I must admit, this is sometimes a mystery to me in terms of when it, up. sometimes it updates just that same instance will, or sometimes you want just drags another one, another one on top. Right. I'm just going to get rid of that because it's a bit distracting. Go back to here. Oh, yeah. So let's do that. And I can change the height of the blur. Now, the fun part of it is if I select this box, text boxes default to trans are movable in Final Cut. So I'm moving this box, and it's the blur, the box is changing, is matching the position of it, right. which is quite handy. Um, so I could put this here, and then I can select this and include, increase the amount of blur, the size of the box. Maybe I should make it much more, really get my point across. Don't really need to make it quite so bright. Now, notice that it's, I think, yeah, polygon to, so you can kind of mess with your bokeh if you want. Um, and this is kind of strange to do with uh, your lens splits. Anyway, so this is an example of how a single link parameter can do quite a lot to link uh, a cropped area. Yeah. <laughs> so I can go back to motion. So that's the kind of thing that happens over the whole duration of the title. You notice that. But what I might want to do is have everything fade in and then maybe fade out. So to be lazy, I'm just going to go basic motion, fade in, fade out. And this means it will fade in over 20 frames and fade out over 20 frames. Um, so let's make it something, a little, maybe a little faster. That's and half can, a second. And you can see yeah. that, right? When you look at the fade in, fade out, you, I mean, when, when you open that project up, you'll see the t in the timeline. Yeah. And you can, you, know, you can have that there, but you could also move the... So instead of keyframing, there's like a... Um, yeah, you can see it in the and, and what you're seeing at the very bottom is the function of the operant oper, operator uh, over time. You know, so that's the yeah. so we call it the F curve. Um, that's that's uh, that's there. So but there aren't any keyframes. Yeah. Now, there's a slight mistake here: is the fact that the actual 
background is also getting faded in and faded in and out because it's inside this right. big group here. So what I need to do um, is just, I'll just drag this out. Maybe if I, it's always a bit of fun when I'm trying to, it's the top level. So I'm going to just going to group the background and give it a name. It makes it slightly easier for it to work. So I'm going to move it out. Got to read, name as you go, name as you go. So now what's happening is that this behavior that was attached to here, the fade in, fade out, is attached to this group of the type and the clone layer. By the way, it, what, the thing that, that Alex said very, very quickly and just kind of, I just want to underline it, name as you go. It is so easy. It is so easy in motion to build up a bunch of layers and then look at them and go, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And what does generic dot generic dot final mean? Like, like, you know, like it's, you know, because I dragged because that was the, the asset name or whatever. Uh, so renaming what it does while you're working is super useful. Anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to save that and then go back to final cut. Or as the Americans say, final cut. Uh, it's a subtle distinction. So if I do this <laughs> and then... Uh, so this is coming on like that, which is quite nice. You know, it's blurring, right. fading on, and then right. So you can add all these. You can add all of these little um, uh, behaviors. And the great thing about the behaviors, as opposed to uh, keyframing them, is that you can really get lost in a lot of in a lot of frames. You know, a lot of keyframes. You can start to have lots of them. And and here, these are something that are very easy to adjust. If you grab onto the, um, I believe, if you grab onto that behavior. Um, you go, you'll see it as a layer and you can, you can actually, you can move it in there, but you can also move it, the, the actual length of the layer, right? Um, oh, yes. That, so uh, this applies to the whole layer, uh, at the, the whole group at the moment, but I could, um, apply it to anything. So I could just drag this to only the text. But you can also grab onto it, the, that fade in, fade out effect itself oh, yes. and just grab exactly. onto it. It's got yeah, a little bit so I could, so I can have it, this doesn't make, unfortunately it only, it, it doesn't apply, it only applies to the opacity parameter right. over when it's applied. So at the moment, this kind of happens in which it starts off fully 100% and then fades on. So you right. kind of have to, uh, but no obviously if I was doing something else, that would be yep. fine. It's very useful sometimes to change the animation speed of something just by dragging it. Yep. It's very useful. So let's say I want to uh, move this move this up, for example. So let's see. As you can see, it's moving up over time. So what I can do is that, okay, let's make it move in. Move in. Now at the moment, it's moving to zero, zero. Um, let's see. Let's say I want to move from off screen. So notice, notice how I, you can see this, what it's going to do here in terms of you can see its Y position is being controlled by this behavior. But the fun part of it is that I can choose different parameters, I can change the settings, you can immediately see what it's going to happen. So I want this to move from a value because I want it to move from off screen. So I want to choose from and then I drag downwards to say, okay, I want it to come from down here. So now this is coming up. Notice this is applying the move behavior to the text box and the clone, the mask of the clone layer. This one is just moving with it. So I don't have to worry about the mask anymore because it's just connected to whatever the coordinates are of this. So just to show you, we've got a little cog here that shows you that it's the blending is being controlled by a behavior and little and some cogs on the coordinates because it's being controlled by this move behavior. And yet what Alex said was right is the fact that if I want it to happen more quickly, I can just do that. And as you can see, it happens, it'll happen over this period of time. And war could happen over a longer period of time. So As let's say, up. yes, exactly. It's a bit too, a bit too creepy. So we'll do that. Alex, how do you ease that? Luckily, there is a speed control here. So you can say like that, and then it immediately shows you the shape of the curve. So even though we've got these F curves and what I would call a kind of keyframe graph, um, it's really useful having these here. So you can actually see what you're doing as you do it. Um, so you've also got a pretty similar looking curve here, but that's quite nice. Um, let's make this 700 or seven, minus 700 or something like that. So I'm going to, I would just press, I'm going to choose save. Go to final, final cut. 
I'm just going to drag it on here. And this comes on. Now, uh, just as a, a, by the way, I can type in whatever text here, of course. Um, and of course, these typefaces, it's any type of typeface you like. In and can you of, um, turn a lot of those things off if you want to, as far as the publishing, and do you still have those same controls? You can make it so there's no control of the typeface at all. You can make right. it so that this is not even visible. Or you can just and, choice the font, or you can just choose the... Yeah. So uh, there's a way of doing that. So let's go back to... I, I just command tab to go back here. At the moment, with titles um, like this, I go to text, um, it's defaults to editable in FCP. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be at all, which means if I do this slight catches they won't be able to move it afterwards but that's not we'll, we can sort that out later but with the text here i can say okay i need to publish that text because there has to be a way of modifying it so if i go back to the project and have my text and then as soon as you make it so it's not editable directly in final cut then that tab in final cut the one with the fonts and stuff like that will not appear and everything this would not you won't be able to choose anything else and any different or you can choose or to or you can publish it yeah. to or not you know you could say i want to let them oh, yeah so i could publish just the fonts for instance right or the size i have a, a question on publish uh so whenever you click publish in in motion it mm. applies those properties that allows them to be changed in final cut uh yeah. so is there any way to go back and recover something a property that you've deleted that you that you haven't if you've unpublished that you discover later that you want to have control over in final cut or do you have to go back to motion add that property back in and publish it to get it back uh, in final cut yes you do have to do it in um, motion you can't get any of these parameters back um, and and i think that's partially by design you know, that's a, that, like, I think that prevent the editors from messing around with your yeah. creativity. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and it also, it's just keeping it simple, um, you know, but you can, you know, it is definitely from an art director's perspective, it is a very, you know, useful process to say, this is what you get to change. Like I don't, and, and I, I will say as I use these, I use these together as my, when I go into Final Cut, I don't want those things. Like, I just want to be able to grab onto the thing. I don't want to accidentally grab something or accidentally move something. I just want what I... And a lot of times if you're in... I mean, Alex is jumping back and forth, but if you have two monitors, oftentimes this is on the same computer and there's just two different monitors and you're making an edit, hitting save, reapplying it, making it, you know, anything else that you need there. Um, yeah. And in order to, to change it in motion, do you have to have that same project? In other words, if the, let's say you've got a title designer who's creating all the titles for show and he unpub, you know, he, he locks a lot of the parameters and then sends it over to the editor and the editor discovers that, you know, well, the background that we're going to use these titles over is a different color and the colors that he chose clashes. Does he have to, if the editor then wants to change it, he has to be able to access motion and have the same, the full project from motion, motion project in order to make the changes? It's not, in this respect, it is much more simple than the way that After Effects does it. So okay. say, say, for example, somebody has given you an installer, it's possible to build installers that install these in the right place. I'm just going to put this back on the timeline just again, like here. So now I've got this and, oh, look, I can't edit the font. I can't do anything here because I made it so that I, but I can type the text in here. This is the text. But as you can see, it's not exactly uh, text safe. <laughs> um, I mean, I can choose that we've got this kind of problem. Um, but we, but some features are available. But what I can do in Final Cut, if I can select this and choose, well, I'll do it here. If I control, hold down the control key and choose reveal in Finder, I can even choose to actually open in motion. So this will actually open the thing in motion. And what you supply people or what you get is a motion file. It's a single motion file. So one title, one file. So it's not like After, uh, After Effects where you've got one project and then multiple mogets. So, and it's one of those things like for, for those, like for, I have a lot of the FX factory stuff and you get it all and it works all in Final Cut, but you hit that and you open up the motion file to dig through it and make adjustments and 
as best you can. <laughs> a lot of times, a lot of times they're, the, the, they're, they're harder to edit than they look, but, but as best you can, if you want to change certain elements or do other things that are deeper into it, you can. So, um, what I, what I'm doing now is that I'm just changing it so that the, this text box kind of works a little bit better. Um, so I've got this thing coming on and, um, I'm just going to explain the thing about timing because there's obviously, there's a slight problem. If I make this title longer, then the animation will happen more slowly. So I'm just going to show you that again. I've got this title coming on. Uh, I'll just add it again. I'm going to put it here. A. And then the advantage is, one advantage is that I can make it if I need to make this title longer and shorter. I should move it over here. I'm option dragging, by the way. And I make the duration of this much longer. Um, this is hard to see. <laughs> so what I need to do, I'll move this over here, idiot. Um, I'm going to call this B. Maybe. So I'll do it over there and then you guys can't see the zoom controls, but oh, there you go. So my point, as you can probably guess what I'm going to say is the fact that if I, if you watch the A come up, it comes up quite normal speed, but the B takes longer to come up. If you say you watch A and B now and B is slow because I've made it longer. Because what happens is if you get any of these titles and change their duration, then all the animation just gets spread out over a and it's, lot of it's not, time. Yeah, it's, it's stretching all of that, right? And anything that yeah. just grabs all of it and just pulls it apart. Yeah, which we often usually <clears throat> don't want. By the way, just so you know, this is a 30p timeline and it's quite happy at me using 25p uh, titles on it. Final Cut really doesn't mind. There's no problems with uh, frame rate at all. Um, so if this is interlaced, then it would animate um, each of this, this, this movement would happen on every field. Because it's doing it, it's doing it in seconds, right? And then just doing whatever frame rate, doing yeah. it at whatever frame rate it has. So what I want to make it do is, so I want this to come on, or always take the same time to come on this, the, the letter, however long I've set the duration. So how do you make some parts stretchy and other parts not stretchy is a way of putting it. So I'm going to use this so I can see the full, how long it takes for this to come in. I think this is maybe, yeah, I'm just going to go and the move. Just, what do I move my uh, zoom controls? This is the bit that I kind of forget how to actually make the, the drag. The, oh, there you go. Sorry, pardon me. You can't see me do this, but I can. So I could see from this curve that the the move finishes at this point. And if I select the move, fade in, fade out, that's probably taking a bit too long. So I can say I want the fade in time to stop there. So I want this to always be the same, this to be stretchy, and this to always take the same and the way you do that was with mark markers. So with the project selected, I choose mark markers. <laughs> Let's try deselecting the, the project layer, but having nothing selected here and choose mark markers, add marker. And then with that marker selected here, go to mark markers, edit marker. This is not straightforward. But if you say, I, didn't know I, this, I was today's years old when I knew I could do this with markers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, this is incredible. So, uh, okay, yeah. So uh, there's, there's a choice between a build-in and a, so the build-in marker will be everything up to that point is going to take exactly that duration. In this case, 20 frames at 25 frames a second, 25 frames a second. So I'm going to set it to optional. Um, I can't change the name. And it shows a special dashed area to say this is bit is going to be stretchy. So if I put this on the timeline, then this bit will be stretched equally in order so this is uses the fixed duration. So I'm going to do the fade out. It's going to be here. And I'm going to choose... Uh, now, if I choose markers, I can add a marker, but it's going to add the marker to this behavior. So watch it. Make sure with uh, you deselect everything. Because I'm using the keep or shortcut shift command A to. So, yeah, so you can add the markers to the whole project or you can add them just to specific attributes. Yeah. 
And this only applies to the whole timeline, the, these these special markers. Um, so I've got this type standard, it's a standard marker, so I'm going to say an optional build out. Okay. That means and this Alex, is always going to take When you time. say optional, that means you're going to get the checkbox to be able to turn it on or off. Is that correct? Absolutely. So I select it here, and it's got a couple of added some pr parameters up here to say build and build, build in and build out. So I'm going to say, and I'll, you could say, because build, some people may not do. So um, animate on, maybe fade off, maybe, if you want to be a bit more detailed about what it does. And you might want to, you can actually set a default here, because often I think people actually don't want to fade it off. Uh, or sometimes they might want to not want to because they may want to go to a cut. So let's default it to not fading off, which means that I put it on the timeline, it'll show all this and stretch this to the correct length, but not show this bit. So I'm going to choose save. Go to final cut, final cut. And select lower third. If I double click, um, I'm just going to put some, say we've got this lower third thing. Um, Chris Fen, let's call you Alex Fenwick, because we should all be called Alex Fenwick. So that's coming on here. I, this is the older version. This is to let you know with this actual uh, lower third selected, if I double click lower third, the new version, it's copied the text that was there and then now uses the new version, including these new settings up here. So now when we look at this and I animate it on, that animates on in proper duration and then it will cut off. It won't fade out at the end. So I'm just going to get this and I'm going to, get another one um, let's say and then make it much shorter but it's still the animation will still take the same time so what happened was that the in part is always going to take the same time and the rest of all that duration is happening between here and it's being squashed down into this space here and fade off is turned off Yes. So then what I might want to do is turn that on. And what it is secretly doing is it's just going to play this bit at the end. Sorry, I'm just doing it quick to jump to one to the other. And then we wait for a moment and then it fades off. But notice that it <laughs> looks like only the text is fading off. Yeah. yeah, I think I need to change where that fade out thing is being applied to. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so... Okay, that's. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, there are. Obviously, yeah, let's, I go let's lots of different in, directions. Let's let's, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's let's jump into the questions. Um, that's a, I mean, because that's exactly what we wanted to sh I mean, show you. What we can show more uh, based on your questions, but also just talk about motion. But really, understanding this incredible connection between motion and Final Cut, and being able to design very complex solutions that are very flexible and have them really happening in uh, in real time. Uh, Courtney, did you have anything else that you wanted to ask? No. Let's go to the let's go to the first question. Okay, from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. Is it practical to purchase motion if you don't have access to Final Cut? The answer is yes. For me. <laughs> I use motion more than I use Final Cut. Like, I, I produce documents and motion all the time, like, without, without Final Cut at all. Yeah, go to Alex. Absolutely. It's... It started off from 2004 until 2011. It couldn't make templates of Final Cut Pro directly. Uh, it can make kind of templates, but not ones that appeared straightforwardly in Final Cut. So it was Apple's version of After Effects, but that lives inside the GPU as opposed to the CPU. So yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a, has, as I said last week, it has 75% of the features of, of After Effects for uh, two months worth of rental. Yeah. Um, and but 95% of the features you actually use if you don't do much compositing. Well, and also, and then it has a whole bunch of things that doesn't occur, you know, like the behavior, when you start getting used to the behaviors and the replicators, and we haven't even started talking about those, we'll try to drag Alex back in to talk more about those things. But those are, you know, it, it really, um, you know, it's got a lot of, a lot of tools to it. Now go to Courtney. So if you're using Premiere and you use Motion, you could just create green screen backgrounds or black backgrounds to use them as lower thirds and then publish them as, render them out as that and then bring them in as an object in uh, Final Cut, in uh, Premiere. 
Yes, I'm absolutely. I mean, what I'm hoping for one day, given the nature of titling in, on Media Composer especially, is that a uh, enterprising assistant editor decides to make all their lower thirds and graphics in motion to, to be used in uh, feature films, because that would work very well in terms of media management and uh, replacing with the same piece of media and just exporting to the same place. So you do get a little bit of that as well in terms of exporting to the same place with the same file name. Um, it's the way we used to use motion. And you can just export in four 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 four. I mean, you you can in four by four, so you can send it out with an alpha channel. So you can send it with alpha, yeah. All right, yeah, good, good, Mitchell. Yeah, I just wanted to point out how how similar uh, using uh, Premiere and uh, Motion, or excuse me, Essential Graphics and Mogert files, almost spot on exactly what you're doing here with uh, Motion. It would be nice if you could. Again, I was going to say, would it be nice if you could uh, uh, use them counter uh, uh, mm -hmm. intuitively at any time you need. Next, yeah. next question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Alex. Before you... Sorry, pardon me. Uh, essentially, uh, the Mogats were uh, inspired, obviously, by the to-do list, which was like, okay, how does it work in Final Cut? Let's do that. And they've done as much as they can. And they've added some new things that are slightly better, like you can group lots of, lots of parameters and, and subgroup them, which is very good inside uh, Premiere. Made in, in, made in After Effects. So there are a few ledges, but there's lots of things that can't be done as easily, such as on-screen controls and lots of things and making transitions and lots of other stuff. That's we haven't even talked about on-screen controls. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, next question. Next question from James Fosling in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, have you created any naming conventions to reference for your renaming on the fly? Um, it's really just for me. So I kind of, uh, I don't. I mean, I, I one of the features I've actually asked for the motion team is a automatically, automatically rename based on what I've just uh, chosen using a template of my choice. That's what I'd like. So if I link one for one thing to another and I say rename based on my template, it should be able to, but it doesn't, that doesn't exist yet. So no, I just sometimes say anchor point from and then the name of the other layer that kind of thing, or scale from, or scale times this. So I actually have to type stuff in, and I have just, as I go, I just have to, essentially, if you look at the free t my free plugins at alex4d.com slash free1 or free2, I've named everything in there and explains how things work. So it's worth opening them up and having see how things link together. Next question. Stefan Fischer from Würzburg, Germany. Does all that only work with Final Cut, or can the lower thirds also be used with Resolve? Sadly, only Final Cut. So I would, obviously, if I was uh, for Apple Final Cut, I would make it so that these templates could be used in any video app on the Mac, and then it will be up to each developer to make them those templates work in there. That's a big Apple try thing to do, and also a big for each developer to do, because they want to maintain cross-platformness. Well, uh, isn't, isn't, I mean, technically, isn't Motion just an XML, XML file? So someone could build an impor importer. Yeah, I mean, of course... The motion playback system is in, inside your iPhone because that's essentially the thing that is used inside clips in an iMovie right. is, is the motion template engine. And so right. those are created on motion, those templates that appear inside clips, which is Apple's social media app. Um, so, so, so to underline that, we're talking about Final Cut, but you could build things in motion and then export them out and use them and send, give them to people to use in clips. Unfortunately, no. I just know that this is how Apple created them. So if okay. you look inside the say, IPA, like, that's a whole new thing too. No. Yeah. So if you look inside the Apple's, uh, you know, I, iPod, uh, you know, so iPod, mm -hmm. uh, iPhone app uh, container, and you can look inside, then you can see those are just made in motion. Uh, so it would be really nice if. So that what that means is the app doesn't get any bigger, but it, the iOS and iPad OS have the ability to play back motion. Uh, templates where they maybe the playback mm -hmm. engine isn't built into the apps it's just part of the operating system so if it is it would be nice if keynote played them back and word and resolve but not yet unfortunately yes. yeah i'd love to have more back and forth between keynote and motion like there's a lot of keynote behaviors that i would love to have in motion <laughs> because you know because they're just they're just nice and fun and, and easy and it'd be fun to be able to just add them to an object so um next question I think uh, Alex just answered this one, but we're going to shoot anyhow. Robert Shoji from Los Angeles. Has Alex created a group of motion lower thirds that are available for us to use and learn from? Absolutely, yes. So you can see how um, things work in there, including this one lower third in which uh, the letters are blown away by leaves, as this of their leaves. So what happens is it starts off with just, bl they blow into place, 
and then at the end they blow away so it's using a behavior in order to do that and you can see the in mar the markers for in and out there and um yeah have, see how it works <laughs> so that's available yeah in alex4d.com slash free one and there's quite there's like 60 templates there including some titles in lower thirds so you can see how they were put together you can open up emotion and see how i did it and i'll actually have to look at the documentation to remind myself how i did it as well <laughs> <laughs> next question Robert Sababidi in Poland asks, Alex, what information would I need to include in the brief to you if I wanted to ask you to prepare lower thirds for a show for me? Well, there's the design brief, which I'm used to actually getting in After Effects because nearly everybody who designs TV designs it all in After Effects and practices it, exports in After Effects, and then they kind of share it. The client then signs it off, and then I get the signed off thing, and I say, oh, well, instead of these movies, could you send me the After Effects file? But um, obviously, I have worked with things like Photoshop files and Illustrator files, and then I'm given animation curves. And I essentially, most people are used to sending me these kind of quadratic uh, animation curves that work in After Effects, but those ones you can't directly type into motion, sadly. So the answer is, it depends. What have you got? Uh, what do you know? Um, but the, a professional brief would be After Effects and some associated quick times to show how things work. And then I'll come back with a question saying, but how many lines of text do you are allowed in this box? Can it be three or four? Do you want the text to rise up from that baseline or do you want it to hang down? And how do you want other objects to be? How much do you want me to lock it down? And the answer is I would suggest lock it down as much as possible so people can get on with their work without messing about with too many different options. My very high tech brief when I send uh, stuff to Alex is here's the here's the here's the client keynote. Um, here's gives you a kind of a look in the feel. Uh, Want to keep it simple? Um, probably use this font, and let me know what you let, let me know what you come up with. <laughs> and Alex sends me back something, and I go, eh, make it look a little bit more like this. Like it, it, it's because it, 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 and usually there's not that many because Alex has done so much of it that I don't have to like he'll usually do things. If, when you're working with someone who's really good at what they do, you try not to get. It is what Alex gets all the time is a very verbatim set of directions. But I've learned to oftentimes, you know, give some design things to fit it into the overall look and feel that the client wants. So that's that's there. But to oftentimes stay out of the way <laughs> and, and a lot of the little bits and pieces all fly together. And then you and then you review it and then I give feedback and then the client gives feedback and let me make, make it a little faster here, a little slower there. But it's a it's a little bit more organic. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. So in practice, when it comes to, uh, effectively, I've used Motion like I used to use uh, Macromind Director in the 90s and PowerPoint in the in the zeros and Keynote in the tens. When somebody sends me a script, if they just send me the script, I have enough experience to work out what the important words are and yeah. then how to link those together and how to make those clear. And if somebody sends me the brand guidelines, I know all the colors that are needed and all the fonts and all the branding and also maybe their logo icon library or what happens. It depends mm -hmm. on what I get. And I make it look as if it's essentially from their point of view, it's PowerPoint plus, but I don't mind that. It's still able to do some stuff that are not possible and has a nice flow to it and animates yeah. smoothly and quickly. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida. Have you worked with importing 3D objects in motion? Have you done that, Alex? No, I haven't. I have. So yeah, over to a, a much more experienced Alex. Um, yeah, so I actually, there was a, there's a, if you go up to a great place, if you want to download a reasonably good 3D model. Now, number one is you can open them in, um, if you go to the Smithsonian and search for USDZ in their file, they have Smithsonian 3D, go in there and they've got tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of files. Some of them are OBJ, some of them are STL, some of them are a lot of other things. You can download, but, you know, it's a government agency, so we already paid for them, you know, in our, with our tax dollars. And so they're all sitting up there. And you can you can grab onto them um, if you use. Uh, there is an app from Apple called uh, Reality Converter, and it will allow you to take OBJs, any OBJ that you find on all the different, you know, anywhere on the internet. You can convert it to not all of them. Sometimes they break, but most of the time you can convert them to USDZ. Now, once you bring them as USDZ, you can turn. You can do it. Also, you can export. What we learned is that you can export these out. Um, you can go through Substance. So Adobe Substance actually turns out to be a great texturing app. So a lot of stuff when I build stuff in Motion, I will texture it in Adobe Substance. So a couple steps to that. One is I build it in Cinema 4D typically or bring it into Cinema 4D 
and because I, I have to set all the UVs. And so I set the UVs in Cinema 4D. I then um, take it to Substance, and now I can just apply the textures that Substance has or other textures and build them all out and uh, customize them. And then you export out as a USDZ file, um, and I can then drop them into into um, into motion. Uh, once they're in motion, I can animate them. So I, if you go to Clarity.io, you'll see a model that Chris Fritchie in our own group actually built. And um, I don't. Have, the video is is out of date, so it's not on the on the website. But I built a video with that model, and all those images that you see there from that model. That's a USDZ model, and I built the video from it all inside of Motion. So it was all built inside of Motion, um, and I did all the 3D animation that I would normally do in another app. And the advantage of it is it was rendered really fast, <laughs> so I can move things around, and I can I don't I don't have to preview as much as I I did before, and I could add the 2D graphics over on top of it and behind it and everything else while it was working. Um, so it works really well. There, there's one little issue, which is that there is some um, inside of motion, and this is a general problem with real time on the Mac right now, is that USDZ will have a sl slight bit of um, aliasing, you know, because it's not oversampling. To keep it in real time, it doesn't oversample. Oversampling means it renders at a much higher resolution. If you set 4x oversampling and you're in a 1080p thing, it's going to be like an 8K file, you know, like it's going to, and it slows things down as far as the render. So when I do the final video render, I actually oversample myself. So I'll render out an 8K version of something and then I'd run it through compressor and then I play with the compressor, um, the algorithms that are used to go from high resolution to low resolution. There's a lovely, something with an L that I use. <laughs> so that I like, uh, um, and that's not bicubic um, and it softens it in a way that I like. Um, and so anyway, so that's that's the only thing about, the only gotcha with the 3D models is, is that on curved edges and everything else, I find that they, there's just a touch, it's just a tiny bit of aliasing that bothers me. Um, and so, um, but, but what I will say is they, they, once you get in, in there, you can rotate them and animate them. If they have built in animations, there's a couple of them. There's a whole list of 3d objects that are already in motion. I think they're kind of cheap looking. <laughs> I think Apple could do better. So you can also go to Apple, Apple's website. If you just want to play with it, there's a, if you do Apple USDZ, there's a whole file of like little toys and little rockets and stuff like that, that you can play with, but you can get any OBJ and convert it. Um, and then there's some USDZ stuff that's coming up on Smithsonian. Uh, next question. Robert Shoji from Los Angeles, California. Once you've created a lower third, can you share it as a plugin for someone else to use? You go ahead, Alex. Well, there's two ways of doing it. The most straightforward thing is that if you know the magic place for it to go on in your Mac, then you know where to put it. And essentially, there's a folder in your um, home folder. There's a movies folder inside the movies folder. There's the motion templates folder inside the motion templates folder. There's some categories titles, transitions, generators, and effects. And in this case, you'd put it in the titles category. But it is possible to make an installer. So what I do for the BBC and other people is that I make an app that can run on their Mac and it puts everything in the right place. Um, and you can make installers, I'm no developer. And it's, I can't remember the, essentially it's a program called Plugin Manager, which is part of um, Pro Maintenance Tools. So it's a Mac. Uh, is that part of the developer tools or is that its own thing? No, it's a commercial. It's a single buying the, uh, thing that I bought, I don't know, five years ago, something like that, maybe eight years ago. And uh, you set, you select your plugin and choose make app. And then if you like it, you can include a, the background and the installer can be your installer or something like that. But also in order to make it easy to run people's machines, you register, I register as an Apple developer. Uh, for fifty dollars a year, and then I put my uh, credentials in there, so that means it'll run on any Mac because it's been uh, signed by my developer uh, thing. So in case if I put some bad things in that one of these apps and that was revealed, then uh, Apple can immediately turn that off. So that's the reason why you do that. So the answer is yes, you can uh, make an installer, but in practice, if you go to um, my alex 4 dcom com slash free one you'll see some instructions on each plugin page about where to put these things without an installer in a what folder put them in. Um, Cause initially if you don't have motion and you have no custom templates at all, then those folders don't exist. But as soon as you put, make, add one uh, template made a motion to final cut, then, it, uh, then all those folders will be created for you. So essentially when I say those folders, they're just in the home folder in movies, motion templates, and then it's either in the titles folder, the transitions folder, the generators folder, or the effects folder. Next question. 
And next question is from Robert Sababody in Poland. Can you share a lower third that you're really proud of and talk about how you build it? Hmm. Um, I suppose the thing is that some of these things, um, the design-wise of them, yeah. There's one that's very complicated that I'm kind of messing with and I'm kind of exploring, but that's more like an interesting technology as opposed to it being designed. So let's see if I can actually uh, find it on here. Um, but it would be, it's hard to explain how it works because I'm just, it's a kind of thing, uh, a possible product in the future. Alex 4D slide. Um, so it is possible to do this kind of thing where you, uh, I might maybe actually actually share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Excuse me. Sorry about that. So, um, so this is cool. This would be something like Alex 4D slide. Because I think it's essentially when I'm making templates for other people, if they're going to be used by lots of other people, then I don't put too much design into them. I want it to be able to work with any font and any point size. So in this case, um, I've got this text called slide text, and then I can choose how many words are, are shown initially. And then the idea is, after a certain amount of time, this happens. And then I've got a little overlay thing that shows me the kind of a response curve that happens. So I can see that it does a little movement like that. So this is something I'm kind of just, I don't know, messing about with at the moment in terms of uh, being able to show a curve in Final Cut, but well, it's not too complicated, but enough so people can get an idea of what's going to happen. Um, let's see if I do that, change the sliders. <laughs> so you can see I'm drawing this curve using the template and then I can turn this off. So I'm kind of proud of it, but it's not from a design point of view. It's from a kind of um, technology point of view, because the advantage of this from my point of view is I can select this text. It can be happening anywhere on the screen and I can use any standard font and it'll still work. Because um, sometimes what happens when you design things, it's you get into a position where you can even make it work in 3D like this and then do the same thing again. So that is a kind of something I am very happy with from a technology point of view. Um, from a kind of work point of view, I didn't necessarily design this, but I really like it. Um, BBC News. Um, and I like the Astons that they have or lower thirds that the BBC have on their, on, if you go to YouTube, you'll see um, these most of the videos there on YouTube that are made for YouTube are made using these templates. So that's the BBC style of a uh, name and uh, lower third is to have it at the side because they have so much stuff going on at the bottom and the top that um, they like to, they think having the stuff at the side is a good idea. So I go to move this out of the way and here are the controls. I can choose to have the name or just the designation. So notice I had to make it so the line either animates to the length of that line. But if I actually include the designation, then of course the line has to be in a different place and has to animate to the length of whatever I type in there. Um, and the white's a little ahead of the red. Yeah. So if you look at it, it's got a kind of like a, so. That's really nice. And also they have a, what they call an upper position because they have a little bit of stuff up here. Mm -hmm middle position and lower isn't that low, but it's just slightly lower. And then I can change the alignment if I like. Um, and also again, the build in build out, you know, about this is gray. And the, sometimes the bar can be, this is for a fun inside thing. Cat one obit means if a category one person has died, then we use black instead of red. And you oh. may have known of some various <laughs> category one persons have died recently. So this is so that you're ready to do at short notice um, different standard colors for these things in terms of these lines. Um, so one fun thing about this one, if I get to this uh, get this timeline, I've got my pasta, but let's say I'm going to duplicate project as, but I'm going to make it uh, vertical and uh, 1920 by 1080. I might have put too much type in here to do, for this to work. So I go to Pasta Tool, 
and you can see that the lower third, even though even though it's kind of not visible there because I need to select this text and I need to change the special conform to fill just to make it easier. I've got a bit too much text, but it's repositioned based on the fact that the rules for this um, text right. are that they're in different positions depending on the aspect ratio. So this one, I can choose it to be black and also I can choose social safe um, because obviously there are different safe areas for social media. And you um, could have ones where you had a, you had a checkbox that's like TikTok safe or Instagram safe or mm, whatever. Absolutely. Safe. Yeah. Yes. So I do have some TikTok templates as well that I did more recently. But um, yeah, so the cool thing is these titles, the same file will work in different aspect ratios perfectly fine. And you, there's a trick to that, but that's quite involved, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, so I'm going to change this back to here and I'm going to choose. So the upper is different for this one. And uh, let's go to the left. So this is the, this is much more of a kind of example of what an editor wants. They don't really want to set a huge range of colors. They want to have just their specific colors that are allowed. Right. And they don't want to have to choose different positions necessarily because choosing a different position means a bit too many choices and they should really just be getting on with doing the edit, if you see what I mean. So this is upper, middle, and lower for this. So this can't go any lower according to this one, uh, according to that rule. So even though I choose a different thing, it didn't show lower value. And if I go to social safe, I turn social safe off. That means I can actually move this slightly lower. This is to allow for subtitles to be here. So this is more of a kind of a, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm running out of time. I apologize. But it gives you some idea of a, a kind of like a real lower third, if you see what I mean, the practicality of it. Uh, and the kind of options you might have and try not to give too many options, but enough so you can sort out. It's more about the, all the use cases. So what I want from a client is think through the use cases and uh, bear those in mind. And what sometimes then I could come up with design rules that intersect their design right. with the practicalities of social media, for instance. That's great. Chris, real quick. Yeah, I'd like to remind, <clears throat> remind everybody that at the top of the hour, Alex said, I'm not a trainer, but I know some things. He knows a lot of things. Uh, total <laughs> understatement, Alex. Thank you so much for sharing with us. <laughs> really, really amazing. So uh, thank you so much, Alex. And um, thank you thank you to the rest of the panels for the great first hour as well um, and, and, and being here for the second hour. Can't do this without you. Thanks to the, uh, in, the producers for all the great questions in the first hour and the second hour. Um, and uh, thanks to the incredible team that uh, works on the development of this uh, to, to allow us to do this. Um, you know, this is not, again, not your standard little Zoom. It is a, a very, very complex process of, of uh, development, of management, of, uh, you know, there's just, a, it's an incredible um, little bubble that's been created by, by everyone that's involved. Every, this is one of those few shows where the people who are watching, the people who are um, on the panel, the people who are developing on the back end, people who are cutting the show, we're all making the content for ourselves. It's really kind of amazing, amazing mix here. So thanks, thanks to everyone. Um, we traveled, drum roll please. Uh, we traveled 71,000 miles today, 115,000 um, uh, kilometers in the Tlaloc Traversal. That's what it would have taken if we had wandered around to Chris's house and to Mitchell's house and to Alex's house to get these questions answered. It would have been a lot of miles um, and a lot of kilometers. Um, and, and that is 568 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. Alex, good job. Yeah, I got uh, four slug bugs uh, in your background there. <laughs> there were those check those check boxes are so cool. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, he's dead. Black line. Yeah. It's <laughs> well, and just and just the, the 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 ability to build those all up and, and you know again when we're doing especially when we're doing stuff when we we use these a lot much simpler version than what Alex showed at like Macworld and stuff like that back in the day because you could, uh, not Macworld, but other other conventions in the 20s, you know, in the, in the teens or whatever. And uh, the editors could just be slamming things through and it all looked the same. You know, they just hit the buttons that they need, they have the things, they just throw them on and everything just does what it needs to do. So it's really good. Excellent. Thanks. See you, buddy. <laughs>